So today we're looking at a topic that is sort of close to my own field of research and that is medical imaging. So specifically, we're gonna look at organ segmentation. And you might ask, well, why is that important? Well, if you want a really good answer to that, you can watch my last uh, podcast video with Dr. Carl Otto, who runs a company that does organ segmentations on CT images that's used in many, many different clinics around the world. Now, the reason why you may want to segment an organ is if you're doing, for example, radiation beam planning. If you're firing a radiation beam at a patient to treat them with cancer, you want to know how much radiation is delivered to a particular organ. Now, traditionally, it was a physician who would go with the help of a little bit of mathematical tools to go and segment those organs, but it took quite a long time. Nowadays, they have AI models that automatically segment those organs for you for yourself. So what I'll show you today is how to access CT data from a very popular data forum. Uh, we'll download a artificial intelligence model that does organ segmentation, and we're going to evaluate that model on data. But I think what's most important is that in the process, we're gonna learn how to use all these important Python libraries that you need when you're doing medical research. So hopefully it gives a little bit of a tour of the domain of artificial intelligence in medical research in Python. If you guys want to support the channel and learn how to code just like me, I highly recommend checking out my Udemy course, Python STEM Essentials. Coupon code in the description, you can get the course for $10 for the next five days. All right, so the first thing you'll notice about my setup today is I have two things in the explorer of uh, VS Code. You can see that I have my uh, YouTube channel sort of directory where I have the IPython notebook. And I also have this empty uh, data directory. And so the path of that data directory is specified here. Um, that data directory is gonna depend where you wanna download the data from this video. Cause it's a pretty large CT file that we're gonna download. It's about a gigabyte in size. And so that sort of depends where you want to best place that on your computer. So this is the location I'm using. Uh, you'll have to change this file path depending on where this folder is. And if you want to add other folders to your Explorer here, you can really easily do that just using file, add folder to workspace. And then you can choose uh, some sort of directory on your computer. And so I've specified the data path here. Another thing you'll notice is that a lot of these packages today we're using are unusual. So OS and NumPy, these are pretty common. Uh, PyTorch, PyDiCom you probably haven't seen before. Uh, we have matplotlib, of course, for plotting. And then all of, well, at least all of these probably look pretty unusual. Uh, so TCIA stands for the Cancer Imaging Archive. Um, this is basically a function that we can use to download data uh, directly in the script. And MANI stands for the Medical Open Network for Artificial Intelligence. And this has all the sort of functionality we'll use to download the model that was trained to segment the CT image uh, and then pre-process and post-process the data as well. Okay, so we'll import the libraries and we'll specify the data directory. So this is where we're gonna save all the data. This includes the CT image, but it's also where we're going to save the model and the model parameters as well. So the first thing we need is the CT image. And so we're gonna download some CT data that we'll be using into the data directory that I have here. Uh, so you can see I've specified this cart name. Maybe this looks a little strange. So NVIA5656, uh, five, six, five, six. It's, it's basically just a code here. Uh, and this corresponds to a particular CT file on the Cancer Imaging Archive. So if I open up um, the Cancer Imaging Archive here, you can basically, it's a great repository for lots of different medical imaging data. So if you go to access the data and search radiology, uh, this sort of portal will load. And so you're brought to this portal here and you can actually search uh, types of medical images by imaging modality. So in this case, we're looking for CT images and it will sort of query for those. And more specifically, we're looking for a whole body CT image. So you can choose anatomical site, and I'm gonna scroll down here to whole body um, CT. And so now it's loading again. And so I have these whole body CT images that are here. And so if I want to get access to them, uh, I click this, and so this is a uh, PET scan, but the PET scan is always done with a CT image as well. And you can see that I have a CT whole body um, scan right here and I can sort of view it. So if I wanna just look, see what it looks like before I download it, there's this nice little uh, widget they have where I can scroll through all the slices though it's a little bit laggy. Uh, and you can look at the different axial slices of the CT image. So when you're confident that that's the one you want and this is the one we'll be using for the video, um, you can actually add it to cart. And I have my cart here, it's 515 uh, megabytes. 
Now, if I want to download it directly to Python, which is what I'm doing here, you can go share, share my cart, and there's this little code right here for downloading the image. And so this shares everything that's in my cart at the moment. Um, of course, the thing that I specified here was what was in my cart the other day. It's a slightly different code, but it's the exact same image. Uh, and then it will download your data to the uh, directory that you specify. So in this case, I'm saying data dir. Uh, it's also going to return a pandas data frame as well. So we can actually look at some of the features. So we're just downloading the images right now. Remember, this is 515 megabytes. So it'll take a little bit depending on your internet speed, of course. All right, so that took about five minutes and 20 seconds for me to download. Um, the download time also depends on their own servers as well. Uh, they're a little bit slower right now, but that's okay. We have all the data downloaded. Uh, and if you look at the data directory on your computer that you've specified, uh, you should have a folder uh, with this big long name here, this big long number, and then a bunch of individual .dcm or .dicom files. So each one of these individual files actually corresponds to what's known as an axial slice or a slice like this of the patient. So if the Z axis points up, it's a 2D slice at constant Z values. Uh, so each one of these is a separate uh, image. So these are like a bunch of 2D images. Uh, each of these images is 512 by 512. And so the reason why they store them as separate files is because if you stored them all together, it would be a pretty large like 512 megabyte file. And while things like that exist now, like DICOM is sort of an old standard. So they uh, separate the data into these separate files here, which can be kind of annoying for opening them up. Uh, so the CT folder, I'm just going to combine the data directory with basically the name of the folder right here. So this gives me the folder where all my CT files are located. So there's two main ways to open up this data in Python. Uh, the first way is using uh, PyDICOM. This is a, a little Python package that is specifically deals in opening and managing DICOM files. Uh, so for example, here we'll read the 394th axial slice. Uh, it gives me what's known as a PyDICOM data set. Uh, this data set contains a bunch of meta information, a bunch of information about the scan, such as what time it was taken, um, and then other sort of parameters here. Uh, these are important for the x-ray. What's the tube current of the x-ray, the exposure time, uh, table height, uh, basically all the information that a uh, physician or anybody in the clinic would need uh, to know everything about this uh, CT scan. Uh, and then at the very end here, you have the pixel data, which contains all the actual image data. So if I want to access that, I can just call um, dataset.pixelarray, and this gives me an image. Uh, of course, I look at the image uh, shape, and it is 512 by 512. And so the image is a 2D array, and so there are specific units that are used for CT images, known as Hounsfield units. Uh, that's sort of the way that most people interpret CT images. But when they're saved in the data set, sometimes the units are converted to a format that helps them be converted to integers, for example, so they can be saved a little bit easier. Uh, so typically when you open this image, it will have units that are sort of uh, convenient for storing the image. And so you need to convert it back to Hounsfield units using what's known as the rescale slope and rescale intercept uh, features of the data set. So I can change my image so that now it has the proper units of Hounsfield units and I can plot it. And this is sort of what the CT slice looks like. You can think of Hounsfield units as being sort of a measurement of density, though that's not quite what they measure. And uh, minus 1,000 corresponds to air, zero corresponds to water, and about over 1,000 plus varies is uh, bone. Now, the issue with this is I've only opened one of those slices. If I wanted to make a 3D image, I would have to loop over every single one of these uh, files in order, stack them up on top of each other, and make a 3D image. And that gets really annoying, by the way, when these aren't sorted. So the beautiful thing here is they're all sorted by the slice number. Uh, oftentimes these names are random and you actually have to access where they're located in Z in order to stack them together and make an image. And that's a real pain for opening up these sort of 3D uh, DICOM files. Uh, but thankfully there's another option and that's using the uh, Medical Open Network for Artificial Intelligence or Monai library. Uh, and Monai is, if, if you're doing AI and you're in the medical field and you're doing any sort of research, uh, you'd be using Manai. It is sort of the standard for anything artificial intelligence in medicine. Um, and so it's basically an extension of PyTorch. Most people here are familiar with PyTorch. Um, and it has a lot of functionality for uh, pre-processing, post-processing, opening, doing operations on medical data. And there are so many important functions that will save you so much time using Manai. And one of these things is actually opening the CT image. 
Uh, so Manai has functionality for easily uh, opening up this sort of data. Um, so I've imported a bunch of, um, they're called transforms from Manai, and there are things like loading the image, orienting the image, uh, and a few other sort of transforms here as well. Um, these are used sort of to process the data before you do any AI with it. Uh, so for example, load image would take a file path and return a 3D object. Uh, orientation takes in some parameters and reorients the image. Uh, and you can sort of bundle these transforms together into a pipeline to do a bunch of operations on the data, which we'll get to in a sec. Uh, so the first thing is we'll just use the load image transform. And it can return a few things, but we only want it to return the image in this case. So we'll define an uh, instance of this load image class called image loader. Uh, and then my CT, it's just, it's sort of like a pipeline. I just feed in the location of the folder, CT folder into image loader, and it returns for me the CT image. So it took about eight seconds. And if I look at my CT image, it's a pretty unusual data type. It's called a meta tensor. And so for all intents and purposes, it works exactly the same as a PyTorch tensor. You can do operations with it, you can do whatever. But the main difference from a PyTorch tensor is it has this meta attribute, which is super useful for medical imaging. It gives things like the uh, pixel spacing. So this is uh, 0 0.97 millimeter resolution in the axial plane and then two millimeter resolution in the separate uh, Z slices. Uh, it gives things like the position of the patient, the shape of the array, and then these uh, affine matrices. I won't get too much into them, but they are really useful for when you have two different medical scans um, and the position of the patient is different and you want to align those scans together. So having this information is essential. And if you just had a tensor by yourself, uh, you'd have to basically manage all these things yourself, but this is automatically managed by Monai. So now we can plot any plane of the CT image that you want. So what I mean by that is we don't just have to look at axial slices. We can index and look at what's called a coronal slice, which is sort of a, a front slice like this. So that's coronal and then sagittal would be cutting me in half through the center. Uh, so let's look at a coronal slice. So we'll look at the uh, middle slice. Remember it's 512 by 512. We're gonna look at the central coronal slice of this CT image. And we can plot it and we get sort of something that looks like this. And so the issue right now is that this guy is upside down and he's not oriented properly for what we particularly want. And so for that, we'll use another um, an eye transform. Um, the first thing we need to do before we add this other transform is we want to add a channel dimension to the data. Uh, those of you familiar with uh, machine learning, uh, you know that um, if I look at the shape of this, this gives a 3D array. Typically, there's always a channel dimension and there's always a batch dimension when you're dealing with data. Uh, so we're gonna add a channel dimension right out front. So this becomes one by 512 by 512 by 975. Uh, the channel dimension is important because when you're dealing with images, like colored images, you need three different parameters to tell you the color of that voxel. Now, in this case, we're dealing with uh, density only. It's, it's a sort of a, you can imagine a vector field where one number tells you everything you need to know about that location in space. So it just becomes a one dimensional channel, but having multiple channels can give you more information about an image. So we're going to uh, create a channel transform. Same thing as the load image transform. So we create an instance of it. And then we basically feed in this channel transform. We sort of modify the CT image. And if we look at the shape of it, now we have a channel dimension. Uh, the next thing we'll do is we'll reorient the CT image. So this orientation corresponds to the X, Y, and Z orientation. So S stands for superior, P stands for uh, posterior, and L would stand for left. So this orients the axes in such a way that when we load the CT image and we look at a corresponding coronal slice, now of course we have to index the channel dimension as well, and we look at the coronal slice, uh, converting it to NumPy, and we plot, we get the image exactly sort of as what we expect. And now there's a few things to note here. Uh, the first thing is that you can see the liver on this side of the body. The liver is on, always on the right side of the body. But if I'm looking at this patient, like from the doctor's perspective, if I'm looking at this guy, even though this is on the left-hand side, this is technically patient right. So the idea is that you're looking above somebody when you're looking at these images. Uh, now the liver is on the correct side of the body. And sure enough, the head is at the top, the feet are at the bottom. So this is an orientation that is uh, pretty common for medical images. Now, the beautiful thing about Manai is we could actually combine all these transforms together into a pipeline using Compose. So for example, this is a pre-processing pipeline for my data before I feed it into the AI model. So here I'm gonna compose um, loading the image. So it takes a path and then it returns the image. 
Uh, then it's going to ensure channels first, it's going to add a channel dimension, and finally it's going to reorient the image. So this becomes a whole pipeline where it basically applies this operation, feeds it then into this operation, which then get fed into this operation. So I can just basically give the CT folder and call the entire pre-processing pipeline, and then I can get the coronal slice like I did before and basically plot like I did before. So these sort of pipelines are essential. And the reason why I'm going over it so much here is because these pipelines are important for understanding when we download the model and start to use the model on the data. And so another option, and this is typically done because it's a little more neat when you're dealing with data points that might have multiple things. So for example, suppose I have a, a CT scan and then I also have a PET scan or an MRI scan or other scans as well. Uh, maybe I want to do certain things to a CT image and certain things to an MRI image, but I still want them all to sort of correspond to the same data point. So I have a CT image, an MRI image, maybe I have um, some parameters like the patient weight, the patient height, all listed sort of as a single data point. Uh, well, then the sort of transform you would use for that is called a dictionary transform in terms of Manai, and I'll sort of get what that means. But basically any of the um, class names that we've specified before, you add a little D to the end and that makes it a dictionary transform. And so rather than taking in just the folder path for load image, uh, the load image D takes in a dictionary. So in this case, um, I have a dictionary where I specify my image key. That image corresponds to this CT folder to start with. And then I have some other key, which I'm just calling 42. So for example, you could have as many keys as you want um, that are different images corresponding to that particular data point. So the preprocessing pipeline now is a dictionary transform. I have the same thing as before, but now I need to specify which keys is sort of this transform is done to. So in this case, it takes in this dictionary data, it looks for the key image and it applies the load image um, transform to it. Uh, it does the same thing for insured channel first, it takes in the key of um, image here as well. And then finally, the same thing for the orientation transform. So it's only gonna apply these transforms to image. So it basically, this will return the dictionary, but with the image um, entry now modified to be the loaded image, et cetera, et cetera. So I specify my data, and if I look at my data to start, of course, it's just image, some file path, and then um, some other key at 42. So then I can sort of create my pre-processing pipeline and feed the data through the pre-processing pipeline. So it's gonna modify this dictionary. Uh, it's always keying on image, so it's gonna apply these uh, transforms just to sort of this initial CT folder. Sure enough, if I look at my data after, my image now becomes the meta tensor with all these transforms applied to it uh, and some other key while well, it stays at 42. And if there were transforms that I wanted to apply to some other key, I would specify them differently in this pre-processing pipeline. Now, the reason why this is so useful for medical imaging is because often you want to do things with multiple different types of medical scans combined. Maybe you have a CT image, a PET image, a SPECT image, MRI image, and you want to, pre you want to make one pipeline at the beginning and you want to sort of, um, you know, operate on each of those things separately. You want to align them. Maybe sometimes you put two of them together. So you would key on multiple things and that allows you maybe to align the two images. Uh, so these dictionary transforms are super useful in Manai. So the next thing we'll do is we'll download the segmentation model so that we can segment all the organs of this guy right here. Um, and so I obtained the segmentation model from uh, Manai's model zoo. Now this is a beautiful website. Um, because basically anyone in the medical field is doing AI research. Um, if they write a paper and they have a model that does something really well, then it can, they can upload it here and it can allow anybody in the world basically to use it. Uh, so they have ones for segmenting MRIs, for example, or, um, you know, classifying nuclei, the MRI, uh, prostate MRI anatomy. So there's different things for, depending on which uh, research group uploaded their model. Uh, so the one we're looking at is the whole body CT segmentation. And I can look at the details here and you can see that it basically segments all these different regions of the body. So it's a very powerful model in terms of what it can do. Because I think there's 104 or 105 different regions that it can uh, segment. And so the question is, well, how the heck do we use this model, right? And how did I know? How did I set up my video with all the code knowing what to do with this model? That's really the tough part because... You know, this is sort of a thing, not just for medical physics, but in general, if you're given something on a website like this and it looks really cool, but you just have no idea where to start with using it. Well, the first thing to do is to just take a short pause and make sure you read everything. And I'm very impatient and I typically don't do this myself. 
but you can see that it actually gives a link to this Monaya bundle format. So this tells you some information about uh, how to bundle something and how things come. So, you know, for example, you have your models, you have your model parameters, you have something called metadata, maybe you have some documentation. So these are all the files that people would upload with their model. And you can sort of read into this. But even after going through this, there's not a whole lot of information that's particularly useful. So instead, I'll try to find some sort of tutorial page on GitHub. And so they have lots of different things for using uh, Monai. And if I scroll down, they actually have a folder just for the model zoo. And I can go here and you can see that there's actually an example of using the prostate MRI anatomy model notebook. And this is basically where I got the information I needed to make this video. So they have a really nice way of um, downloading data and then preparing the pipeline and various things like that. And it's very similar to sort of what we did. So whenever you're faced with a problem like this where you want to use something, just be patient, read the documentation, look for tutorials, etc., and you should be fine. And of course, what you are watching right now is a tutorial. So you've made it this far. So the model name in this case is whole body CT segmentation. Uh, the reason I know that is because if I go back to the model zoo and I go to whole body CT segmentation and I look right here, you can see the name of the model uh, basically listed right here, whole body CT segmentation. And so I specify that uh, right here. And then I basically call the download function. So the download function I imported from uh, manai.bundle. So that's how they bundle all the models. And uh, from here, I should be able to just basically give the model name and then download. And then it also wants the place where to save the model. So here I'm also going to save it in this data directory. So I was able to download all the parameters in about 6.3 seconds. And now I have my whole body CT segmentation model. I guess there's a zip file and then the actual uh, bundle here for everything I need for the model. So it gives things like configs, uh, docs, and then the actual model parameters here. So if you were to read the documentation on the Manai website, you would see that if we want to use a model for inference of data, so the model's been trained and now we actually want to use it in practice, uh, the file that we're most uh, interested in is going to be the inference.json. So I'm going to move this over to the uh, right hand side here and I'm just going to make it a little bit smaller. Uh, and then the other thing that's interesting is the metadata. And this basically tells you everything you need to know about the model. So I'm going to minimize this a little bit and we'll just make this screen bigger for now. So uh, the metadata is everything we need to know about the model, the change log, things that have been updated with the model since it was first released. Uh, and I can scroll down and it basically tells me, well, what are the outputs of this model? Uh, it's going to be integers and those integers tell me which region um, is sort of which organ. And there's a hundred and I guess five different regions, one of them being background as in not an organ. So there's a few modifications I want to make to the inference. And the reason I know to make these modifications is because I understand how the pipelines work. You'll notice that this uh, target compose is very similar to the way that we composed this pipeline here. And if you look, you're composing all these different transforms here after you run the model. Hey, so future me here. Um, you can see in this post processing pipeline that there's this final sort of bit here where it saves the image to disk. Uh, I was originally going to delete this part of the pipeline like this and just so that it would keep the image in Python. But it turns out that this actually just additionally saves it to the disk as well. It doesn't actually remove it in Python. So we'll keep this part here and you can see that it's going to save to the following output directory. Uh, and the output directory is specified up here but I don't want it saved in the same place where I'm running the code because that's going to be where my notebook file is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and find the folder path that I specified here. Of course, this is a Windows folder path. And I'm just going to replace this. Remember, include this in single quotations inside here. Uh, now these uh, slashes tend to mess this up. So I'm just going to do a single slash here, here, and here. And um, I'm going to add an additional folder called mask. So it's going to, in the data directory that we have, it's going to save this in something called mask. Now you may notice that this looks different in other parts of the video, and you may notice that um, this looks different in other parts of the video. I changed this after the fact. So if you see that, just make sure that you have this here and make sure that you have uh, this correct output directory as well. Uh, the other thing I'm going to change is that there's uh, two different model types. There's the high resolution model and the low resolution model. Now it takes a very powerful, and I mean very powerful computer to run the high resolution model uh, because the data basically 
you resample the CT to either 1.5 millimeters or 3 millimeters for the low resolution model. And it takes, it's, it's very computationally expensive to run the high resolution model because of course with smaller voxel size, you have a larger image, takes up a lot of computer RAM. So we're gonna set it to false high res and now it's going to use the low resolution model. Uh, the other thing I wanna do is uh, you'll notice here that it specifies a device. So this is the torch device to use and it's gonna try to use the GPU or otherwise it's gonna use CPU. I just want to remove this part here and always use the CPU. Uh, the reason for this is that it takes a very powerful graphics card to run either model. And you're using like 20 gigabytes of GPU memory, which most people don't have access to on standard computers. Uh, so we're just going to default it to using the uh, CPU. And there's one other location where this is specified. So what we'll do is we'll specify the model path and the config path. So the model path corresponds to the location where the actual model parameters are saved. So in this case, we're using the low resolution model. Uh, so we're going to point to this directory here. Uh, the config path is basically the uh, uh, JavaScript file for how we're going to apply the model. So in this case, um, you could see here that there is different configs depending whether you're actually going to be training, evaluating, uh, or doing inference. So inference is once the model is trained, we're not gonna be modifying the model, we just want to use it on data. And from this, we'll create an instance of the config parser called config. And then we're going to read the configuration path, which of course is the inference. So now I have this object called config and it's basically a Manai object and it knows everything about this file and it's gonna help us basically run the model. So something you'll notice about this file is there is a pre-processing pipeline um, there is an inferrer pipeline and there's also a post-processing pipeline here. And each one of these is gonna be useful for opening the data and pre-processing it, feeding it into the model, and then um, once it's output from the model, actually turning it into a format that's useful for us. So we'll define the pre-processing pipeline from the config. Um, and then basically we can use the pre-processing pipeline to open up the data in the required format. So for example, if I call the pre-processing pipeline on the data, it should return a dictionary with this sort of image key here. So it's got an image and it's got a meta tensor. And you can see that there's values of negative one. Um, of course, this is useful for feeding it into the AI model. If I actually look at the parameters of the pipeline here, uh, you could see that one of the things it's gonna do is it's going to normalize the intensity. Because usually when you feed something into an AI model, you want it not going from negative 1000 to 1500 with Hounsfield units, uh, this will bound it between negative one and one. Actually, that's what's being done here with the scale intensity. And then of course it has all the metadata as well. So my data is uh, open and ready to be fed basically into the model. So what we can do is we can get the model by using the get parsed content, um, the network attribute of the JSON file. This will actually open the model, uh, but the model has all random parameters right now. So the model that is being used in this case uh, is a seg resnet and it basically gives all the parameters for initializing that model. Now we're not going to be actually using it to train. So um, the first thing we want to do is we want to load the parameters that they trained, which are saved in um, this file right here, model low res.pt. Um, so that's the model path that I gave. And then we're also going to call the model.eval to make sure that it is in evaluation mode. Um, the next thing is the infer. So this pipeline will take in the data and the model and returns the model output. So it actually contains some extra processing steps because the data, if I look at the shape of um, my data here, you can see it's been resampled to this sort of awkward size. Um, and an AI model can only be fed things of a particular size. So different CT images, of course, are gonna be different sizes. That can be a problem for the model in terms of runtime as well. And so what this is gonna do is it's gonna basically break up the CT image into a sequence of uh, 96 by 96 by 96 chunks because the model runs very efficiently on these chunks. It runs them and then it basically combines them back together. So you need the infer to do this extra step. So the infer will do those extra processing steps and then also feed it through the model as well. So now I have the infer and then the post-processing step. So I deleted the save image D so it doesn't automatically save to disk. And this is the post-processing pipeline. I'm just calling the get parsed content uh, method of config and then feeding in the post-processing so it will sort of link up to this here. So now we're ready to start making uh, model predictions. So putting this all together, 
Uh, we feed in the CT folder. This is sort of a dictionary. We call the pre-processing pipeline on that from this file. This will get my data pre-processed. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is, okay, first thing we need to make sure we're not calling um, any gradient backpropagation here. Uh, if you leave out this line here, you will totally crash your computer. You need a very powerful computer in order to run this model in any sort of way where it does backpropagation. And of course, backpropagation is only required for training uh, AI models as well. Uh, so the first thing is that uh, the data uh, in its current format, data um, image dot shape, you can see that it has the channel dimension, but it still doesn't have the batch dimension that we need. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is we're going to unsqueeze it. By the way, if I do this here uh, and then call shape, it now has a batch and channel dimension. So I'm going to infer this sort of tensor here. So I'm feeding this into the infer. Uh, and the network I'm using is model. So it takes in the sort of pre-processed data and the um, uh, model that we're going to use to evaluate. And it creates this new key in the dictionary called prediction. So we have our original CT image. And then we also have this new key called prediction. Um, this prediction, of course, is also going to have this shape here. Uh, so we will remove the batch dimension from the prediction. Uh, then we'll call the post-processing to the data. So then we have the post-processing pipeline as sort of specified here. And so you'll notice while this is running, if I open up my task manager here and look at my CPU usage, uh, this is going to spike. But the other thing that's going to go up is, of course, the memory usage as well. So you can see that the cell is running here. And the memory usage is quite substantial. So I have 32 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, I'm using 20 gigabytes to run right now. So if your computer is a little bit... Um, has less memory, you could either use a smaller CT image, sort of um, by doing what I did with Cancer Imaging Archive, finding a smaller CT image, uh, or I guess you could buy more RAM, or you could download more RAM, actually. Um, <laughs> no. So future me here again, you'll remember that earlier in the video, we um, changed the output directory where the mask would be saved to uh, this mask folder here, and I've just ran the segmentation, and it's going to have saved the image to the following folder. So if I open up my Explorer here and I look at um, this directory here in data, there's something called mask, uh, this file, and then there's this uh, nifty file that we've output as well. All right, so the segmentation is complete. It took about a minute and 31 seconds on my computer. And if I look at the shape of the segmentation, you can see that it is the same shape as the original CT image. And so what we're gonna do is we'll look at a coronal slice of both the original CT uh, at slice 250, and then also the segmentation as well. And so we'll just use a, a, a color mesh plot to look at both the CT and the segmentation. Uh, and you can see that the CT image is right here, this slice, and then you have all the different organ masks for the CT image in an array in Python. And so I use the NiPy spectral color map. It basically is assigning a, a different enough color to each of the different regions of the body. Uh, so each of these colors cor uh, corresponds to a separate organ here. So the question is, what can we do with this? Well, there's many different things that you can use for this mask in medical imaging. Um, one of the things they do is they use these uh, segmented masks for radiotherapy planning. So if you're shooting a beam at a patient and you want to minimize dose, for example, to the spinal cord, uh, you can look at the total sort of radiation dose. If you do a sort of simulation of the beam moving through the patient, uh, you can use these volumes to estimate how much radiation dose is going to go to that particular volume. Uh, finally, you can just use it if you want to compute organ volumes. So if we know the voxel size and we know how many voxels there are, uh, we, for example, can compute the volume of the liver in this patient. Uh, so that's something I can do here. So the first thing I'll look at is, okay, well, uh, let's look at the metadata and look at what the output keys actually mean. So each pixel is going to have a corresponding number to it. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to look at key number 104. Uh, which is the urinary bladder and we'll find the number of voxels in the bladder by just saying well my segmentation equals equals 104 that's just a boolean array of ones and zeros uh, i sum that together to get the total number of voxels um, uh, the voxel volume is just going to be the well this is the beautiful thing about having the metadata my ct metadata contains the uh, spacing right here and this gives that spacing in millimeters uh, so I divide by 10 to get centimeters, and I take the product of that. That gives me the voxel volume in centimeters, well, cubed, technically. So I should really be adding a little 3 here. And then finally, I can get the bladder volume in centimeters cubed. So you can see this patient has a bladder volume of about 142.6 centimeters cubed. 
So typically things like this, at this stage, you've ran your AI model and you wanna do something else with it. You wanna export it to a different software. Um, and so the one that uh, we'll use for this video is called LifeX. Uh, now you can't just download the software. Uh, you have to make an account. Um, that's pretty easy. Uh, they send you an email and then um, you activate your account and someone there has to manually sort of um, approve you. That takes about six hours. Once they've done that, you can sign into the website and you can actually download this software. Uh, it's basically a really nice software for viewing uh, medical images and um, you know, apply, trying various um, dosimetry or other applications to these images. Uh, we're just gonna use it to open up the image and uh, view it though. So I have LifeX installed. Um, I will just open it right here. All right, so I've opened up the LifeX software. This is a software for viewing medical images. So on the left-hand side here, we can drop in the CT image. So I'm gonna to go to the directory where I saved it in data. And you'll recall that the CT image is sort of located in this folder here. So I'm just gonna drag the entire folder here and this will actually open up all the slices of the CT image and display them as such. So the next thing we'll do is we'll import our mask. Our mask is saved in a nifty file. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drag and we're gonna drop it here and it's going to load all the organ masks. All right, so it took about 30 seconds and we've now loaded all the different organ masks here. So you can see as I scroll through, it's displaying separate masks for each different region. Um, and I can, so there's 104 different regions that it's predicted. It actually gives the volume of every region as well on the right hand side as well. Of course, I can make this a little bit bigger and I can zoom in here. And you can see that, uh, for example, you have uh, the two kidneys segmented here. You can see the liver on this side. Um, the different lobes of the lung have been uh, segmented as well, as well as all the different sort of vertebrae in the neck too. So it's a really nice um, a way to segment these various uh, regions of the body. So anyways, it was sort of a long video today and it gave a little bit of an exploration into the world of uh, modern research, I suppose, in medicine and AI and medical imaging. I know it's very sort of a niche topic, but I hope it was useful for people, especially those who are in the medical field themselves, or even those who picked up a few interesting tips and tricks to learn um, just because you like learning.